Nothing has done more to unite the people of the world than this daring venture into the unknown. His decision was to make the journey, and the world watched and listened. Listen, 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 listen. feel drawn to the Hudson River, and I have spent a lot of time through the years poking around the part of it that flows past the city. I never get tired of looking at it, it hypnotizes me. I like to look at it in midsummer, when it is warm and dirty and drowsy, and I like to look at it in January, when it is carrying ice. I like to look at it when it is stirred up, when a northeast wind is blowing and a strong tide is running, a new moon tide, or a full moon tide. And I like to look at it when it is slack. It is exciting to me on weekdays when it is crowded with ocean craft, harbor craft, and river craft. But it is the river itself that draws me and not the shipping. And I guess I like it best on Sundays when there are lulls that sometimes last as long as half an hour, during which, all the way from the battery to the George Washington Bridge, nothing moves upon it, not even a ferry, not even a tug, and it becomes as hushed and dark and secret and remote and unreal as a river in a dream. I prefer to look at it from the New Jersey side. It is hard to get close to it on the New York side because of the wall of pier sheds. Several years ago, I began going farther up the river to Edgewater, New Jersey, and I am glad I did, for I found a new world up there, a world I never knew existed, the world of the river men. Edgewater is across the river from the Upper West Side of Manhattan. It starts opposite 94th Street and ends opposite 164th Street. It is an unusually narrow town. It occupies a strip of stony land between the river and the Palisades, and it is three and a half miles long and less than half a mile wide at its widest part. The Palisades tower over it and overshadow it. One street, River Road, runs the entire length of it keeping close to the river, and is the main street. The crosstown streets climb steeply from the bank of the river to the base of the Palisades, and are quite short. Most of them are only two blocks long, and most of them are not called streets, but avenues, or terraces, or places, or lanes. The lots are grown up in weeds and vines, and some of them are divided by remnants of stone walls that once divided fields or pastures. The streets are lined with old trees, mostly sweet gums and sycamores and tulip trees. There are some wooden tenements and some small apartment houses, and some big old blighted mansions that have been split up into apartments, but one family houses predominate. The majority are two-story homes, many of them set back in good-sized yards. From these streets, there is a panoramic view of the river and the Manhattan skyline. It is a changeable view, and it is often spectacular. Every now and then, at daybreak, at sunset, during storms, on starry summer nights, on hazy Indian summer afternoons, on blue, clear-cut, stereoscopic winter afternoons, it is astonishing. What's up, party people? And welcome back to another episode of NYC Foodways, your weekly food and culture discussion from the cultural capital of the world. My name is John, and this week's episode is dedicated to the life and legacy of filmmaker Les Blank, whose unique eye for the traditional yielded some of the most interesting pieces of American cinema ever made. This week on NYC Foodways, we continue our series on Joseph Mitchell by turning the page to his article, The Rivermen, originally published in The New Yorker in 1959. In this fascinating narrative, Mitchell brings to wider renown the culture of the men who worked the Lower Hudson River, that great waterway separating New York from New Jersey. One characteristic Mitchell does not share with your typical Manhattanite is his willingness to leave the city at the drop of a hat, and for this we should be eternally grateful. In The Rivermen, Mitchell travels to Edgewater, New Jersey, barely more than half an hour from Grand Central, but culturally a world away from New York. He amusingly describes Edgewater as having some characteristics of an isolated and ingrown old town in New England or the South. 
rather than a place easier to get to from Midtown Manhattan than say Bensonhurst. And it is in this sleepy backwater that we find the Rivermen. A Riverman, of whom only a couple dozen by Mitchell's estimation exist out of Edgewater's total population of several thousand, not only works on the river or kills a lot of time on it or near it, but is also emotionally attached to it. He can't stay away from it. In other words, he is obsessed with it. And these obsessives serve as the perfect foil for the consummate obsessor that is Joseph Mitchell. Obsession is a characteristic Mitchell does share with your typical Manhattanite. And for this too, we should be eternally grateful. His obsessive documentation of the little known, the historical, the unglamorous, the marginal, and the delicious are sharpened to a razor's edge in the Rivermen. This is a piece that allows Mitchell to shine brightest by shining his light on those he so clearly feels kinship with, despite being, on paper at least, completely opposite. The Rivermen sense a kindred spirit in Mitchell as well, and are more than willing to open up about eel fishing, about Edgewater's history, about barges, ferries, and waterborne freight, about shipping on the Hudson in general, but more than anything else, they talk about the fishing for and cooking of shad, as shad fishing used to be a major event in this region. Tragically, like the neighboring oyster beds before it, the shad population, pushed past the brink by countless seasons of harvest, ultimately collapsed so precipitously that a partial moratorium on shad fishing passed in 2005 was eventually expanded in 2010 to ban shad fishing on the Hudson entirely. This is horrendous. There is no beauty, no silver lining in the extinction of such a vibrant local foodway, and it is a further tragedy that we can only experience the world of shad fishing through Mitchell's prose. But such incredible prose it is. Mitchell vividly describes the complicated and enormously expensive endeavor that was required to catch shad in the middle of the last century, and spills equal ink to relate to us the mouthwatering experience known as the traditional shad bake. This is a bit of a misnomer, as the shad weren't baked, but rather covered in bacon, basted in butter, and broiled over charcoal. This now sadly bygone tradition is as vivid a foodway as anything ever recounted by Mitchell. A quick request to all NYC Foodways viewers, if you have any connection whatsoever to folks who host traditional shad bakes, or even just to someone who has fished for shad in their lifetime, please get in touch. From what I understand, there are still areas of New England keeping the flame alive. Let us now discuss the link between geography and destiny. Edgewater's geography, settled early, jammed between rock and shore, largely protected from the elements, blessed by abundant natural resources, and in close proximity to what was, at the time of Mitchell's writing, the most populous city in the world, destined it to play an important role in New York City's economy, despite its relatively small size. This geography also destined it to produce obsessives, the Rivermen. And here is where I think that Edgewater and New York City are more similar than we might initially assume. New York City's island geography and subsequent tectonic forces of immigration, governance, luck, and economics created the tremendous cultural diversity and countless margins that attracted Mitchell's obsessive eye, ear, and pen, and continues to exert an inescapable gravitational pull on myself and millions of others to this day. Some of us don't just live in New York. We, like the rivermen of Edgewater to the Hudson, are emotionally attached to it. We can't stay away from it. New York City frequently feels impossible to deal with. So why are we obsessed with it? This place is insane, an absolute lark, a place out of place, and yet I can't imagine anywhere else I'd rather be. New York City is to some degree also a city of obsessives because it requires an obsessive nature to actually enjoy living here. For Mitchell, New York City served as both an escape from certain obsessions and an escape to others. And I posit this holds true for the legions who come here from afar and cannot fathom leaving. Those of you who know me outside of this screen know that I tried escaping the obsessive pull of New York. And believe me, I gave it my all. But even in my many years away from the Big Apple, I never considered or referred to myself as anything other than a New Yorker. With apologies to Oscar Wilde, the only way to defeat obsession is to yield to it. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week for another episode of NYC Foodways. Peace.